y'all mic'd up? Good afternoon. Welcome uh, to today's Grand Rounds presentation. Uh, please remember to sign the attendance record and uh, also uh, remember to fill out the program evaluation. If you could give the CME committee any ideas that you might have in regards to future topics or future speakers, we would be appreciative. Uh, uh, today we actually have four presenters. Uh, I, uh, I know the two physician presenters well. Uh, they are Drs. Ricardo Arbulu and uh, Dr. Joe Merchant, uh, who are, have been generous contributors here at Grand Rounds. Uh, Dr. Merchant is uh, from the Department of Hematology and Oncology at McFarland and Mary Greeley, and Dr. Arbulu from the uh, Department of Infectious Disease. Uh, they have kindly accepted the CME Committee's invitation today to uh, speak on neutropenic fever, uh, an evidence-based approach to care, and please uh, join me in welcoming them. Okay, can everybody hear me okay? Great. Um, well, it's really my pleasure, and thanks, Steve, for uh, having us talk um, on neutropenic fever guidelines. Um, I wanted to just start by kind of introducing why we're talking about this briefly. This cancer center is accredited by an organization called the Commission on Cancer that is uh, uh, administered by the uh, American College of Surgeons. We've been accredited since 1993, and um, one, of the, one of the guidelines that we have to meet in our accreditation is, is that we have to demonstrate that we're doing uh, quality improvement projects on a regular basis. This talk today is the beginning, or is, is part of a quality improvement project that we have undertaken to improve our care of neutropenic fever. Um, and this, uh, this goal was identified by the Cancer Committee, and, and you know, this is my uh, somewhat facetious rendering of the Cancer Committee, but we all uh, feel pretty strongly about this, that we could do better uh, in our management of neutropen neutropenic fever. As you'll see today, it's not just an opinion, but um, uh, Susan Anderson, one of our oncology nurses, has really looked at this, looked at our current performance as a cancer center and hospital, and and demonstrated that we, you know, that we have room for improvement. So, by way of introduction, neutropenic fever. Um, we're talking about neutrophils. Neutrophils are uh, part of our immune system, and we're all familiar, many of us, with looking at. Uh, white blood cell counts in, in the care of our patients, often you will see that the, uh, you'll have demonstrated uh, neutrophils, monocytes, basophils, eosinophils. The neutrophils are really our focus today. They're the most abundant kind of white blood cells, and they are often s divided in the automatic differentials into bands and uh, which are sort of younger, younger neutrophils, and a mature or polysegmented uh, neutrophils. After bacterial infection, the neutrophils are the first responders, and they have a short lifespan. They're highly modal. They quickly congregate at focuses of infection. They are what pus is, basically. And they have th at least three ways of killing uh, bacteria, including ingestion, degranulation, and then they, they produce something called extracellular traps. They're extremely effective uh, bacteria-killing machines. Definition of neutropenia, um, and this is a little bit all over the map when you read, when you read papers, but it's, no one disagrees that when a person has a neutrophil count of less than 500, that's severe neutropenia, less than 100, profound neutropenia. And in the care of our patients here, we regularly uh, have patients who go into the profound neutropenia range. And often, these are the patients who present to the emergency room um, with a fever. And, and they're the ones, especially, that we want to be in a hurry and taking care of. Neutropenic fever guidelines have been uh, or what, what constitutes a neutropenic fever has been designated by different organizations, including the College of Critical 
Care Medicine and the Infectious Diseases Society of America as a temperature of a single temperature of greater than 100.9 or basically 101 or higher, or a temperature of uh, greater than 100.4 for more than one hour, or for an hour at least. So we often will tell our patients in the oncology office that if you have a fever, a temperature of 100.5 or higher, we want you to go to the, either to our office if we're open or to the emergency room if we're not open. And it seems like uh, neutropenic fever happens mostly at night or on weekends. So, you know, this is just the way it goes. Um, so this is, where, where did the normal temperature come from? Well, this gentleman in about 1850 or 60 in Germany, he had the idea of, let's figure this out. What is the normal body temperature? So he used an axillary thermometer and uh, checked 25,000 healthy individuals and published his results. And his range of normal temperature was between 36.2 and 37.5. Um, and he observed that uh, normal temperature varies during the day uh, with uh, lowest in the morning and highest at night. And it varies from men and women. Uh, women have a slightly higher temperature than men. Um, a, this has been restudied in more modern times at, by the University of Maryland in one study I found. And they found that the normal temperature was 36.8. Uh, that was the mean normal temperature with the range from 35.6 to 38.2. So you will have patients, um, I'm sure all of us have said, have heard patients say, you know, my normal temperature isn't 98.6, my normal temperature is 97 or 90, you know, lower. And there is a, just, you know, just by, ver by, by way of a slight diversion here, there is a, there is a, a range of normal. And, and depending on when they measure it during the day, they may get a different result. Obviously, we're not in, in neutropenic fever looking at rectal temperatures, although they, they are the temperature that most closely resembles or closely correlates to core body temperature because we really try to avoid rectal manipulation in people who have neutropenia for fear of causing infection or worsening infection. Myelosuppression is, is just part and parcel of what we do with our cancer treatment. Um, this is an expected and common and, uh, but major and, and often dose limiting toxicity of cancer chemotherapy. It increases the risk of infection and just to emphasize that um, in our field, we don't have a lot of emergencies, but this is considered an oncologic emergency. It's associated with increased morbidity, mortality, increased hospital cost. Most often occurs when a patient is receiving their first cycle of chemotherapy, perhaps because that's the cycle in which we administer full dose, and if a patient has toxicity, we pull back with later cycles. So just a, a study looking at the impact of neutropenic fever on the health system, the, uh, a study from about five years total, 115 hospitals, uh, many of which were community hospitals, was undertaken in the late 1990s. And out of 55,000 hospitalizations um, with neutropenic fever in 41,000 patients, there was an 11% mortality rate. The length of stay, as you can see, varied according to the type of cancer with uh, acute leukemia patients having a median length of stay of 20 days. And in 1990 dollars, that was $20,000 per hospitalization. So the, the, uh, obviously the patients who had the longest stays uh, used the most healthcare dollars. But there is, as you'll see, some correlation between how fast we treat neutropenic fever and how long patients have to stay in the hospital. The, um, the, this is just from the same study, just suggesting that the number of comorbid conditions um, is associated with an increased risk of mortality. So patients who have one, two, three, or more than four uh, comorbid conditions have a much higher risk of mortality uh, with some patients with five, 
five or higher comorbid conditions having up to a 50 percent mortality rate with a neutropenic fever. These are some of the comorbid conditions that seem to, in, in multivariate studies, correlate with risk of uh, death and uh, risk of development of neutropenic fever. And these are common sense, including older age, pre-existing neutropenia, poor kidney function, hepatic function, heart function. Uh, female gender is at higher risk for febrile neutropenia and, ne and hospitalization. And interestingly, low or high body mass index uh, seems to correlate with risk, probably because the, the um, or sorry, low body mass index, I should say, uh, is, is a risk factor because in our overweight patients, we are often worried about giving them a dose that is truly reflective of their weight, whereas a, a thin patient gets a full dose uh, per weight. For performance status, I just included a couple of slides there about what performance status is. It's something that um, for us as cancer providers, we are often faced with making decisions about whether we treat a patient who is really sick because of their cancer, um, knowing that if we give them chemotherapy, perhaps we will re rescue them in some sense from their cancer. But at the same time, because they're really sick, we know we're, we're undertaking a greater risk with, uh, with regard to infection and challenging that patient with chemotherapy. All right, this is, a, I wanted to give a couple of studies about neutropenic fever in the community, of, community oncology center. And this is a purely non-university centers. They collected data prospectively on patients who were given chemotherapy. And this did not include acute leukemia patients. You can see the type of cancers that were studied. The median age was not very old, 59, and about 38 percent were over 65. And with this, they were able to construct a, a multivariate analysis to look for risk factors for neutropenic fever. And they said that any of these chemotherapies here cause higher risk of neutropenic fever. And this is about a good portion of everything that we, we often use, but small cell lung cancer low GFR or kidney function, elevations of these common liver function tests. Um, these are all contributing to risk. And as you see, they were able to identify prospectively that a person will be at, uh, you know, a high risk of neutropenic fever with, uh, with a number of these. This is important to us as oncologists because current guidelines recommend that we use something called growth factor support if a person has a risk, a risk prospectively of neutropenic fever of 20 percent or higher. So we, we can use this kind of modeling in looking at our, our, our patient, looking at our treatment protocol, and we can judge what, what patient is going to be at a high risk and what patient is going to be at a low risk of neutropenic fever. And we can decide, should I give this patient a growth factor shot after their chemo or not? This it just kind of graphically represents the ride that cancer patients go on when they take chemotherapy. This is their risk of neutropenic fever. Um, it starts it's ve it's at its highest early in their course, and as things go on, it becomes less, probably because we adjust our doses and use growth factor support. But over time, the risk is lower. It's just this first time that we really put people, that we challenge people. There are some patients who present to the emergency room with, with low-risk neutropenic fever, and we, we can consider in some patients who are younger, who have no, ab no abnormalities from the standpoint of their health, we can consider on a case-by-case -case basis whether they can be treated as an outpatient. But still, our common practice here is, is admission for neutropenic fever. This is a study looking at acute leukemia patients who undergo something called induction chemotherapy followed by consolidation chemotherapy. And you can see during induction chemotherapy, there's a 33 percent chance of neutropenic fever. And these are patients who are often hospitalized for, throughout their hospital stay. And with consolidation, there's a 19 percent risk. We were able to get a microbiological diagnosis about 30 percent of the time. But we have many times that we can intervene to improve our quality for uh, 
neutropenic fever. When we start patients on their treatment, when our nurses talk to patients on the phone, when they get to the emergency room or in the office, and we can intervene when they have a fever, when they're an inpatient. This is just a quick um, study of what a hospital, I guess a little similar to us, did in Anne Arundel Medical Center in Maryland. They have a cancer center much like ours, a little bigger. What they wanted to do with their quality in, uh, program was to have antibiotics in patients by two hours from presentation. And they divided patients into four time periods. This, that is presentation into the emergency department until the blood product gets to the lab, receipt of the blood in the lab to the result in the uh, medical record, receipt of the blood result in the medical record to the completion of the antibiotic order, and completion of order to, by the MD to administration. And they said, prospectively, we'll just imagine that each of these tasks takes 30 minutes. And, and let's see what we can do to get them all under 30 minutes so that we get antibiotics within two hours. And they had EPIC as their medical record, and they could use EPIC to judge whether they accomplished their goal. At baseline, they were taking 252 minutes to get antibiotics into patients, so over four hours. They did a transition study. They got it down to 188 minutes. And post-intervention, they were down to 117 minutes. So they got to their goal through their course of their intervention. They were able to study where were their delays. And um, at the beginning, the, most of their delay was between presentation into the emergency room until the blood was drawn and delivered to the lab. That was half of their delay. Another 20% was, um, these sad numbers don't add up, but anyway, another 20%, they said, was there was a delay in uh, uh, releasing the blood to the, emergent, to the EMR. Then there was also delay on the part of uh, getting in, in the, the third part, and, and there was delay by the doctors in ordering antibiotics. They were able to reduce some of these causes of delay to, to zero through their, through their efforts. But this is something that we can use here, this kind of thinking we can use here in our efforts to improve our numbers as well. These were some of their solutions, and uh, I'm getting a little short on time, so I won't go all, all through these. But we, you know, we, we do things like putting mixed doses of antibiotics in the emergency room, educating providers. In my office, we can give people cards that help perhaps facilitate their care in the emergency room. And there can be other things in the lab. It, but it takes many different departments working together. This is a, an effort I thought was interesting that looked at a children's hospital where they, there were two campuses, two emergency rooms, and they were taking care of neutropenic fever in children. And what they did was they, their goal was one hour. And uh, they wanted to get from arrival to antibiotic in one hour. And to do that, what they did was classify patients based on acuity. The, the sick patients, shocky or unstable patients, were seen immediately by the doctor, whereas the neutropenic fever patients who were stable were seen by nurses. The nurses completed what they called a caregiver-initiated protocol, where they uh, drew blood, got an x-ray, got a urine test, and initiated antibiotics from a, a pre-specified list. And they were able to dramatically reduce the time um, to administration of antibiotics to under their goal. This is just purely driven by the nurses. And they were able to also shorten the length of stay. Um, so by, by administering the antibiotic in, within an hour instead of in four hours, you know, you, you have a significant reduction in cumulative length of stay for the hospital system. Okay, Susan, I want to, so next I want uh, to give Susan a chance. Uh, she's a, a very experienced oncology nurse and has been, uh, uh, has taken care of a lot of neutropenic patients. And she's done some research of her own and uh, on our performance here, and I wanted to give her a chance to talk. So thanks.
Hi, I'm Susan Anderson. About a year ago, I was enrolled in a course of graduate study at Grandview University, and one of my projects was looking at the microsystem of the oncology unit. And so I looked at a special process that's uh, unique to the oncology unit, which is taking care of the neutropenic, uh, often septic patient. And so uh, to collect data, I looked at the fiscal year 2013 and had some help from a couple of accountants who gave me data of just actually just medical record numbers for 65 patients. And the qualifying factor in their chart that allowed that medical number to get to me originally was just the diagnosis of neutropenia. And so I looked at these 65 charts, and there were a few that actually didn't really fit. For example, if a patient had been to another emergency room, say in Marshalltown, and then transferred to Mary Greeley, that wouldn't have fit because it, the data would have been too skewed for a very long elapsed time. Um, but it turned out that about 55 of these data points were very useful. So um, the elapsed time of uh, showing an elevated temperature to antibiotic was, um, was actually classified in terms of two types of main patients. Either they reported that they had a fever at home and they went to the ER. Uh, or they reported the fever at home and they went to the clinic. I guess that's one set. And then the other set is the patient who um, either had neutropenia on admission or developed neutropenia while in oncology and then developed a fever. So the time from that fever to antibiotic. And so we would hope that um, we would be able to specify a general framework of what the nurse should do and what the nurse should be aware of when looking at this patient. Um, so the nurse meets the patient and they have a low white count and a low ANC. They might have malaise and anorexia. Um, so we'll initiate fall precautions and uh, have safety precautions there. Then they'll release the order set from, um, that came from the clinic or the ER if it hasn't already been done, which is to make sure that that patient gets prompt blood cultures and prompt um, sampling of urine. And uh, only after the antibiotic is started, at least, should the patient be allowed to leave the floor for a test. You know, I, I'm, I know that, um, you know, we, we may not always think of this. The patient may um, have the blood cultures drawn and give the sample, and the antibiotic isn't always here yet. So um, then the transporter comes to take them to chest x-ray, and we say, oh, yeah, that's okay that they go, but, you know, we need to think about that. What should be done first, second, and third? Um, so this is where the data, the plots occurred, and if you'll see the minutes up there, there's quite a few high numbers there. And if you go to the next slide, then they, I think they were put in an order of... Um, So there's uh, least amount of time to initiation of antibiotic to most amount of time. And uh, it's a little more manageable visually there. But you can see that there are many, many that fall outside that two-hour mark. But if you, you know, hack off the first 10 to 20 percent and the last 20 percent, they are grouped somewhere around that two-hour range. So um, what we'll need to do is just figure out why we're having so many numbers that are in that high range and what to do about it. Where was that delay? Um, were, were high temperatures not reported by the nurse to the physician, or was it something else? Was it the patient that did get taken to a test too soon? And it wasn't always very easy to see in that um, chart auditing process. And that's, I think, all I So um, here you can see in a different sort of graph fashion that um, about half fell under the two-hour mark, but then about half didn't, and that's the half that we need to work on in our future sepsis project here at Mary Greeley. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, with that in mind, uh, I'm really pleased to welcome Carolyn Ross, one of my patients, who um, uh, is a, 
a survivor of acute myeloid leukemia. And I um, appreciate you coming, Carolyn. And I wanted to give you a chance to talk just because what Susan presents and what we've talked about is more statistics, but you ha you've lived it. So I want to give you a chance to talk about what it's like. Did you have permission to share that I had acute myeloid leukemia? <laughs> well, it's fine. He does have my permission. So I, I was treated in 2011 and 2012, um, and I have survived. I did have a bone marrow transplant. It, it was an interesting experience, but I want to, I think this is, I'm glad I got to see your data because some of the data that you've, you talked about reflects the experience I had when I had neutropenic fevers. And I think there's some real lessons you can, you can learn from other facilities. So Dr. Merchant did a fantastic job educating me what to expect. He'd seen leukemic patients before. Um, he'd seen them go through neutropenic fevers. He warned me ahead of time what to expect. And he said, it will happen. And it did happen. Um, and, and I may have not been a good patient, or I may have been a great patient, but I can tell you the first time it happened, I did not understand how quickly it would progress. So that window of time between when you see a fever and those antibiotics go in is absolutely critical, and I've lived it. So the first time, I delayed a little bit myself. I waited too long before I went to the hospital. But then when I did get to the hospital, I walked up to the in through the emergency room. I walked in and said, I'm a leukemic patient. I have a neutropenic fever. I have no white blood cells. And I thought the waters would part and that people would come out and take care of me. And I was asked to sit down in the waiting room. And then when I finally got into the emergency room and I had people treating me and, and they pulled a blood sample, the nurse came into the room and said, you have no white blood cells. Yep, I have no white blood cells. I'm neutropenic. Um, so it, in my experience, and I, I went in a few times for neutropenic fevers, in my experience that, that critical pulling the blood so the blood cultures can be analyzed and also that order to get the IV antibiotics going, those are two key areas. Because I'm a fairly good advocate for myself, and I thought I was clear what I needed when I needed it, and I pushed to get what I needed. So if you have patients who don't push, that's why you get those 800 minutes. Um, it, it's critical that they get that, because those fevers progress so quickly. It's an amazing experience. Um, believe me, the next time I had a neutropenic fever, I didn't wait. We had, the, we had a bag by the door, and my husband said, we will be out of this house in five minutes. That's our goal for the next time. And you will tell me, and we will go. Um, so the first time I had a neutropenic fever, I ended up in the intensive care unit for five days, and the second time I did not. And I think, I think we learned as a family, um, one, you have to react as a patient quickly, but two, you also have to make sure that that hospital understands what you need and why you need it. Um, so I think that's what you, you were looking for, Dr. Joe. Right. Well, it's my, my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Arbulu to help us, um, it's been an invaluable colleague of ours and takes care of a lot of our patients, so thank you. Thank you. And so we have 20 minutes sharp left um, to discuss uh, management of fever neutropenia. Um, and it's clear from um, Dr. Merchants and Susan's data and from uh, Carolyn's experience that what will probably impact uh, the most um, the care of patients with fever neutropenia is not, you know, some exquisite uh, elucidation of what antibiotic to give in the site of the prescriber, but mostly a system uh, multidisciplinary effort that needs to happen similar to the hospital experience that Dr. Merchant has uh, mentioned. 
With that in mind, what we're gonna do in the next few minutes is actually talk to the prescriber. Um, we should not be depressed about uh, all this time that it takes to get antibiotics to people. I'm going to cheer you up is my non-systematic observation. We, even though we delay the antibiotic, we pick generally a good antibiotic. And that's what uh, most of studies show across the nation. And, and Mary really, I think we're no exception. That's why I gave this a cheesy title, Opportunities for Excellence, because we do a good job, but we could do better. And what is doing better according to um, the professional societies that study this, um, you can see a theme here. The spirit of the most recent guidelines from 2010 in the case of the Infectious Diseases Society of America and 2014 for the Cancer Society is that they want us to do good antibiotic stewardship. They just don't want, it's not good anymore in 2014 to throw the kitchen sink at people with febrile neutropenia to save their lives. I mean, you need to give them a broad enough antibiotic, you need to give it promptly, but they also want you to think about these things, you know, um, give them a, a good antibiotic, but do not cause kidney failure in the process, do not cause C. diff in the process. Prevent development of VRE. Um, do I have your consent to mention that was in? <laughs> um, so VRE is something that develops after repeated exposure to vancomycin. So there's a heavy emphasis on when to use it and when to reserve it. Also, contain cost in uh, ultimately prevent hospitalization. Dr. Merchant touched base that there might be some patients that we want to manage as outpatient. I'm gonna tell you up front, I don't think we are there. We do need to focus on inpatient management, do it well since the beginning. Let's start with a real case from last year in Mary Greeley. This is a case of a 66-year-old man who presented to the emergency room with some nosebleed, and she was found to have low, white, red, and, and, and uh, platelets uh, cells. So he was hospitalized. Uh, a day later, he's confirmed to have AML through a bone marrow biopsy, and he starts induction chemotherapy. He gets a pick line placed to that effect. So this is all new. Let's fast forward 13 days later, and he gets a fever, 101.4. He offers no specific symptoms. Uh, he feels rotten uh, since this whole chemotherapy business has started, and he continues to have some nosebleed. You can see that here, his vital signs were normal. He did not appear to have any mucosal damage. He, does, he did have poor dentition to start with. His pick line did not uh, show any gross infection, any redness or any oozing. And here's his total, total white blood cell count. Be aware, when you evaluate these patients, you may not see an A and C because there's no point. I mean, the total white blood cell count in this gentleman was already 100 microliters. Um, may get the units wrong, but we express that in either this format, 0 0.1, or the alternative one, which is 100. Um, um, cells per microliter. Um, his creatinine was normal. So what I want you guys to, if anybody has an audience response, uh, use it to answer this question. I mean, we know this gentleman has high risk febrile neutropenia. What should we give him right now? And I think we can click answer now. Bam. Most people want to give him, is that it? We have four responses. <laughs> Tim, can we do this again? I think we just go back and uh, never mind. Well, let's say that that's a representative sample, okay? So four people among the, oops, somebody's doing a creepy thing in my computer right now. Okay, so polling is open. Go ahead and vote, It'll take 20 seconds. Okay, just more people voting, but let's close the election. And um, most people still want to give cefepine and vancomycin. Uh, some people want to give a combination of three antibiotics, and some people want to give these other options that you see here. So let's go, let's back off a little bit and look at what causes this fever during neutropenia. As you can see, uh, 
large amount of people never get any bacteria, any bug documented in any shape or form. Mo some of them are plain old unexplained neutropenia. We never find not even a clinically defined infection. There's nothing on the x-ray, there's nothing on the sinus CT. Um, those people probably did have some bacteremia from their own GI, GI tract since in these people the n normal barriers that contain this gut flora are distorted and bacteria take free trips to their bloodstream. In some occasions we kind of decide this, this was probably related to quote tumor fever or to the malignancy. But be aware that all these uh, two slices uh, represent people in whom we never had a confirmatory diagnosis. What I mean by clinically defined right here is those who have for instance, a pneumonia on x-ray. And as you are aware from your practice, most of the time we do not recover an organism in pneumonia. So that's what I mean by clinically defined. Some of them, though, will have gram-negative infections in their blood or elsewhere. Some of them will have gram-positive infections, and some of them will have polymicrobial or fungal and otters. This is data from um, 1994, but similar results are demonstrated later. So looking at that, we want to cover broadly. And what broadly means is taking gram-negative rods and gram-positive rods. I'm sorry, gram-positive cocci. Um, and several points can be made, but let me uh, make uh, quick points here. These are the options that the guidelines currently recommend. The one I left out is ceftazidime. We don't carry that. And there's probably some issues on, with ceftazidime that we'll mention. But piperacillin and tazobactam, brand name Sosin, cefepim, imipenem, and meropenem are all fair game at Mary Greeley. We do not carry meropenem in formulary, but I'll mention one situation in which this can come handy. Um, so as you can see here, these are excellent antibiotics against E. coli and pseudomonas. And these numbers that you see here are data from Mary Greeley Medical Center antibiogram of 2013. Um, by the way, those who were barely motivated to come to a febrile neutropenia lecture, there's a lot of things that will be thrown out that are relevant for other infectious uh, diseases management. So this one is a big one. Know these antibiotics that are used uh, frequently. As you can see, they do an outstanding job in treating E. coli um, with no resistance to imipenem reported last year. Um, they all do a fair job, a, a good job, with pseudomonas. And remember, these numbers are in the two digits, at times in the uh, low hundreds. So these differences that we are seeing are probably not significant. The top number, by the way, represents non-urine isolates, blood and sputum. And the lower number represents urine. They go hand in hand for the most part. So great for gram-negative rods in one big thing that you need to consider, the reason why these antibiotics are recommended primarily is because of their good activity against pseudomonas, which is a great, uh, it's about 20% of the demonstrated cases, but it carries a lot of pathology, a lot of virulence. Here, here's that just general considerations is not data from Mary Greeley, but this is generally accepted. They do cover all this spectrum of gram-positive cocci plus anaerobes when indicated. So staph aureus, MSSA, not MRSA. None of these broad spectrum antibiotics will cover MRSA. If you're really concerned about MRSA, there's indications for vancomycin and we'll come back to that. Um, streptococcus and enterococcus are generally covered with the major um, observation here that cefepim does not cover well for enterococcus nor, nor for anaerobes. Conclusion, this is not a great drug when you are suspecting that your patient may have some problem in the intestine. Um, Sosin and imipenem are excellent choices for, uh, for that situation. All of them need renal adjustment. All of them are multiple times a day. And here's some cost consideration for your uh, review. Um, how good are these antibiotics? They have been compared over and over, head to head, and also with a combination therapy with aminoglycosides. As you know, aminoglycosides kill 
most gram-negative rods. And um, it used to be, as some people um, um, seem to still consider, uh, that combination therapy for, quote, double coverage for pseudomonas uh, was recommended. But this has been looked over and over, and what we see is this result. This is a meta-analysis, a Cochrane da database systematic review from 2013. So even after the publication of the IDSA guidelines, they looked again into it. And you can see the risk ratio analysis here with anything to this side favoring um, a good clinical outcome of uh, monotherapy with these antibiotics that I mentioned. And on the other side, a good clinical outcome of combination of those antibiotics plus aminoglycosides. And you can see that the largest study included in this meta-analysis clearly is favoring monotherapy. And we're talking about here all-cause mortality. Bottom line, there is a trend towards favoring uh, monotherapy. If you look at the exact number here, and let me, so this one favors monotherapy, this, this one favors combination. This is the number you want. So there was a trend, so less than one is good a trend towards risk reduction, um, decreased mortality when using this broad spectrum antibiotics. Um, it did cross one, which makes it, we are not able to conclude they were better, but at least they were not worse than giving you a combination. And what's my point there? That in the next slide, we obviously see that severe nephrotoxicity occurs way more frequent when we, when we use a combination. The next slide shows you same story, how often these antibiotics were discontinued because of an, of an adverse event, and you can see that when you use a combination aminoglycoside, is, uh, it was worse. So do you need to add vancomycin? They want us to wait all this stuff, the nephrotoxicity and occurrence of VRE, uh, with the probability of you know, clinical, clinically significant bacteria that do need vancomycin or other drug. So how do we answer this? We need to look at the proportion of, of gram-positive cocci, and in the next few couple of slides, I'd make that point. Um, since the 70s, so we have the 70s, and then moving on to the 90s, and you see this trend that continues to, to the present day, or has rather stabilized here. We see less gram-negative rods and more gram-positive cocci in uh, fever and neutropenic patients. Why? Because we're prophylaxing better against gram-negative rods, and why do we see more gram-positive cocci? Because of these things. Our chemotherapy is more potent and causes more mucositis. By causing mucositis, you open the barriers to all this nice stuff that is living in your mouth, strep viridans and other gram-positive cocci. We're putting more lines on people, which opens the possibility for this guy, coagulase negative staphylococcus, who has an affinity for uh, biofilm, to in infect these lines. So that's why we see, I mean, this is another slide that shows you that increasing gram-positive cocci is largely driven by coagulase-negative staph and other streptococci, mostly very dense streptococci, not by staph aureus. And if you see this black box here, this is staph aureus. It's kind of hovering around the same. So bottom line, based on this, uh, IDSA says only give uh, vincomycin to people who meet this criteria. If you're clinically really worried that this person, even though the possibility that they have uh, MRSA is low, but if you don't happen to treat it, they may die because of hemodynamic stability, please give it now. Pneumonia is more likely to have Staphylococcus aureus uh, than other clinical syndromes, so please be my guest to give vancomycin in that situation. Uh, of course, if they come from clinic and they had a positive culture for gram-positive bacteria and you don't know yet what the susceptibility is, kindly give vancomycin. Um, <clears throat> if you were suspe suspicious that the catheter is infected, that's another indication. Skin and soft tissue infection, cellulitis, that's a still staph aureus, strep, probably MRSA. Now here, colonization with MRSA and BRE, if the patient is known to have those in uh, in the stool or in the skin, you want to treat them. And of course, for a VRE, you do not want to give vancomycin. You want to give daptomycin or linezolid. And severe mucositis, um, I won't have time to elaborate on this, but for all practical purposes, severe mucositis is an indication. 
wonderful um, uh, antibiotic choice, but doc, I'm allergic to penicillin. And then call, people call ID, call the oncologist, they don't know what to do. Um, most penicillin allergies start the same way as um, Leonard Skinner's song. My mama told me when I was young, um, bonus if, if you recognize the song. Uh, and what mama told me is that I reacted to penicillins. So um, this has been looked over and over in the highest rate. So this is, this is a summary of a study. This is from up to date, no secret. You see the, the format and everything. Um, this is um, studies that have looked, okay, what happens to these people who claim having a penicillin allergy, yet we give them cephalosporins, so cefepin, for instance. The highest rate reported of cross-reactivity, quote unquote, was 8.4, actually. Um, so what goes into this? A, they never were allergic, and B, if they were, they have every chance to outgrow that allergy, which that happens. Say somebody has a well-documented, immediate hypersensitivity reaction to penicillins. Please take this one home. Uh, I mean, if you face that particular situation, proceed with uh, this alternative coverage. Astrionam needs to be given for gram-negative coverage, but this drug is not good for gram-positive cocci. You want to combine it with the antibiotics shown here. All others, which are the vast majority of people, can get safely cefepin, and I did not show you data for imipenem, but it is the same, and even lower. I'm putting here less than 8% risk, but it's probably lower, as shown. Bottom line, penicillin allergics can still benefit from this broad-spectrum beta-lactam anti agents and be okay. If you get this particular allergy, I mean, cystic, this particular history, well-documented, or you have a good suspicion of it, you have to use an alternative regimen. I have to make a public um, amendment here. I've been telling people a lot, Astrionam is a lousy agent, and that's based on some reading I did elsewhere, and uh, Connie Henderson this morning via email proved me wrong. Um, these are our, uh, our local susceptibilities for Astrionam. We do not expect it to uh, work for gram-positive cocci, but what it's meant to work for, all well, these gram-negative guides, it's wonderful. Um, Astrionam is a monobactam antibiotic, it's not a beta-lactam, so it doesn't cross-react, it's not expected to cross-react with these others. I wanted to focus, and that's what, that was uh, <clears throat> what we were commended to do, on initial management. Um, this is what happens afterwards when the patient is um, admitted. We do need to reassess, and that relies on infectious diseases and the primary oncologist. I'm linking to the um, online guidelines so we can zoom in. But basically, it's a lot of common sense. You know, if the patient is continuing to have an unexplained fever, well, you want to continue to explore. And where the money usually is, is on CT scans of the uh, face and uh, sinuses, neck and chest, as depicted here. Um, if the patient is getting better, well, you want to start thinking of taking away that vancomycin if they have not had any demonstrated MRSA. And again, we're trying to keep up with time here. I think we're almost done. I definitely want to make this point, and I'm over time for 30 seconds, but uh, this is to make one point that is, I think, very relevant. Catheter-associated infection. I'm asked to diagnose this three or four days after the patient comes in, and the main information for this might be missing because of this. So we need this differential time to positivity, meaning how, what is the difference between the time the culture obtained from the PICC line or whatever port the patient has versus the time um, that the culture took to grow from the periphery, okay? And at times, we do not have that second blood, we have a single blood culture, which is not appropriate. And at times, we have a hard time figuring out which one is which. So again, this is a systems issue, and I don't mean to fix this with one lecture, um, um, but uh, this is something, certainly an opportunity for improvement. Um, the rest, I'm gonna have you read there, but I want to emphasize, and this is nothing that the emergency physician or the admitting provider will need to address, because this is typically something we, um, 
address later whether the catheter needs to come out. There's indications for that, and I intentionally copy-pasted this because they're so clear-cut. Some organisms, some uh, time frame of persistence of fever. Um, over time again, but again, import, very important point I'm trying to get through this year. Uh, we don't use lactate enough to determine how sick our patients are. And those who attended a lecture a week ago on sepsis that we gave on nursing grand rounds um, have a deja vu right now. Lactate is a marker, it's a biomarker. It tells me essentially whether this patient is going to get hypotensive in the next few minutes. I mean, this is a really valuable lab. Guidelines for sepsis recommended. Guidelines for neutropenia, neutropenic fever, do not incorporate this because there's not enough evidence, at least to 2010. There's a couple of studies that came after. Bottom line, I mean, there's little to lose with drawing lactate and if high, being more aggressive with this patient. Um, this is just to depict, I was gonna talk a little bit more about how our system needs to improve. It's not on the provider only, it's on the system, and we need to prevent errors same, same as they do in aviation. I'm gonna leave you with the conclusions there. And, um, if we have time, we can do questions. Otherwise, I'll be happy to stay here and answer them. Have you thought about culturing our leukemic patients for MRSA before they begin treatment? What do you mean culturing for MRSA? To check for colonization. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we are doing... Um, Screening for MRSA in the ICU. Um, I am. I don't think we do that routinely on the oncology ward. That might have just. There's Leanne sitting somewhere in here. No. Um, I don't think we do it routinely. Um, and that might be a good. I mean, again, that's something that we need to study and see if it has proven benefit. It makes total sense because the guidelines are telling you, if they have a history of colonization, give them banco. So, it would make sense. I don't think that's done. Yes, sir. Two things. One is, is there, uh, in these patients, I know procalcitonin is useful in patients with pneumonia. Is there probably utility in getting it in these, these patients as well? Um, and then I think the, yeah. the other is, do we maybe want to set up a, uh, like something in our, system and say, okay, these are, you know, consider doing vancomycin or whatever, maybe even in the order sets. I, I think, I mean, uh, excellent points. CRP and procalcitonin in the 2010 guidelines from IDSA show up as no enough evidence to recommend them, but you should consider yada yada. There's not enough studies. After that, there's some studies that look into it, and um, it certainly has a correlation with severe illness. But you have to be aware that these patients have severe illnesses that are inflammatory to start with, so that CRP and procalcitonin are all, all over the place. As opposed to the lactate, and I'm gonna become a, a lactate Nazi, uh, the lactate is, is not really that affected. Dr. Merchant can correct me if there is any particular condition, but uh, this guy is kind of a more immediate lab that you can check and predict immediate bad out outcomes. Your other question about order sets, I think that this is, that is what we actually need. This lecture is supposed to be something that we need to do to make sure everybody has a knowledge base and everybody's even, but these kind of things, uh, you know, put in an order set that prevents errors, protocolizing who orders and how many doses. That's the other thing because ER orders one dose. That's what I understand from their practice. Who and when, I mean, obviously the admitting hospitalist picks up, how many doses do they write, how, um, big of a dose do they write when infectious diseases or oncology revisit that dose. All that needs to be written and coordinated. So as far as the time. vancomycin, there's an order set. I, I know it, it's in mine where it's basically vancomy vanco IV, it's an order set and then usually I select the fifteen rather than the twenty milligrams per kilogram. It has an automatic consult to the farm D yep. and it also has, it also automatically puts in a daily creatinine. So I don't when I'm doing the order set admitting, I don't continue the orders for the vancomycin. I start my own orders. Okay. The other part is that the the last thing I thought of is that it's actually made it into the lay press about uh, the overstatement of penicillin allergy. 
I actually even saw, I think it was like on the NBC Nightly News, of, oh, guy, I think it was a month or two ago, it was one of the headlines was, if you think you're penicillin allergic, you're probably wrong. That, that, I can't, that resonates, you know. And here in Ames, we have uh, the benefit of a very educated community and base of patients, like we just saw. And, um, and we can, you know, talk in clinic to them, you know, prophylactically, st spend some time with them chasing out where they truly have a penicillin allergy. I cannot agree more with that. People need to run, but we'll be happy to call down any questions. Thank you all. Thank you to our speakers.